I've been doing open data for at least 20 years, probably longer than that. It really came from those of us who really needed to be able to combine data to reuse it in order to be able to do new innovative research. And that kind of whole program really started in, I would say, in earnest in the 1990s uh, for biology. And that's where I've particularly worked in is biology. I originally started in cancer genomics and all the genomics, that has been really a, a trailblazer. So there's tons of um, databases where you can uh, share genomic data. The next wave now is images. There's so many more data intensive and computer intensive methods which are currently being developed uh, to help patients find new drugs and spot cancer earlier. I got involved in open data because I realized that actually all of the primary sources that, that we read in medieval history are actually complete fabrications in a sense because we rely on books that, are, that are, were published in, for example, the 19th century, but they're entirely based on a manuscript from perhaps the 12th century. I'm a developmental biologist and I'm interested in sulfate decisions in the early embryo. My journey with uh, open science and data sharing really started when I came to publish my paper from my postdoctoral work. So I published both the raw data of the microscopy images as well as my scripts. So I'm really interested in how language is represented in the brain and how this changes as we grow up and particularly how this organisation is disrupted in people with speech and language disorders. And we were really interested in this idea that we were going to make all of our data from this project open access, really because research in the area has been really limited by sample sizes. And as we, you know, get bigger and larger data sets, perhaps people might combine these things and be able to use them. Anything can be data. So the data my lab works with, some of it is genomic sequences. Some of it is images of tumor tissue. All of these come with some so-called metadata, like when, where they derive, that they come in different batches. So there is different layers of data and, and all of that has to be collected somehow. Every collection that we have is replete with data within a single manuscript. There's textual data for one thing, artistic information. Some people will track different styles of fancy initials on pages. Every medieval manuscript is also written on parchment, which is animal skin. And so there's people who want to study the, the DNA of medieval manuscripts. When we're talking about open data, we mean digital objects. What we mean is anything that is produced in order to be able to pursue research. It's not just uh, science, it's all forms of research. You know, we're talking about the digital humanities. Archaeology has a great deal of computational activity around it. Uh, it's now using genomic mechanisms in order to be able to do forensics. Uh, we're really talking about a mixing of disciplines now. For me, there's so much rich information. We're generating huge volumes of data and no one person can really analyse it all alone. So really making it publicly available means that other people can benefit and maybe look at addressing some of the questions they're interested in using my data so they don't then have to replicate it themselves. I originally collected this data in uh, New York and then have since moved to London. And since moving over here, two groups have actually got in touch with us, one who are based in Barcelona and one who are based in New York and are using our data at the moment to build a computational model to see how cells may make decisions. The project was very much designed in mind with data sharing and part of this was because we know how difficult it is to recruit these children and we kind of think that, you know, as we kind of grow older as a science, the more data we have, we might be able to kind of get to the point where right now perhaps we only have these 175 children, but over time we'll have 500 and 600 and maybe that will build one day to be really large, really meaningful data sets. Um, and we wanted to very much be supportive of this process. So for no other reason, I think it's really useful to share your data in that sense. I want to share my data partially because I want people to use it. I want my books to be used in classrooms. I want people to be able to translate them into other languages. There's all sorts of people who are, who are non-specialists in the field who might be, uh, they, they might be linguists, they might be, uh, they might be an art historian, they might be a, 
uh, somebody doing bioarchaeology, and they might not know medieval Latin, but they can do some absolutely brilliant things that will tell me something new uh, simply because I've made my, my data available. I mean, people's motivation around sharing data are quite complex. We need other people's funding to do all these analyses. And in my case, this is a charity. I'm funded almost completely by Cancer Research UK. So it is actually the people who gave money to the charity who financed my work, and I think I owe it to them to give something back. And very often, this is my data. We're being good citizens. If we're drawing upon the knowledge pool, we should contribute to the knowledge pool. And also, we should be making their data open in order to be able to support reproducibility, of course, so that people can see, can you defend your claims in your papers? Because I can get hold of the data in order to be able to attempt to reproduce them, for example. There are often people within the humanities that get credit for making their data available. You'll get most credit for writing a book, a bit less for writing an article. Uh, making a data set available in an institutional repository is uh, several steps below that. Academia is really a competitive environment. We've had until recently, and actually still do, a publish or perish kind of culture. If I share my data prematurely or I share it at all, will I lose my uh, special source that means I'm no longer publishable or somebody will scoop me? So the data often is not really the issue, it's the insight. So if you keep mum about what you actually found in the data, you can share the data. Most of the data that we work with are so complex and there's so many different angles to look at it. Somebody else will find something different. So I feel pretty secure of sharing, sharing all my data and I have never been scooped. Another aspect that's very important when it comes to data sharing is commercial sensitivities, intellectual property, and, and patents. And there is a certain tension between that and open science. For me, I think both is important. With my scientific hat on, I'm fully committed to sharing everything. But I also have now my commercial hat on, which is for me equally important because this takes our academic results and transforms it in products that can actually help patients. My academic results on their own just sit there in a journal and they're pretty useless, honestly. So how do we navigate that tension? Well, the, the rules around data and code sharing that we have make it freely available for academic use. But if you're a commercial partner who wants to use it, you have to come through our company side and you have to license it. So not all data is open. Right. And in fact, the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, which I'm privileged to be an author of, and which really dominate the funding policy agenda, the A is accessible. It is not O. It does not stand for open. It stands for accessible. This is because there's a whole myriad of data that is not open. Uh, because of uh, privacy concerns to do with the data. For genetic data, this is identifiable. I give people's genome away. There need to be some safeguards that the people I give it to work responsibly with it. And this is why for most of our data, we have some data access committees. So if you want the data, you have to write up a very short a one pager just saying who you are and what you want to do with it. It's always anonymized data we share and you're not even supposed to try and de-anonymize it. For instance, I think there was previous data sharing that happened and then an algorithm was discovered where you could take these previous bits of data and kind of run photos through the system and try and compare people's MRI scans and their head shape with photos and kind of retrospectively guess who a certain person was. So we now kind of strip the facial information off the scan to try and prevent that. To make your data open, is cheap. To make it reusable by somebody else because it's open is expensive because it requires you to cre create and collect all of the metadata, all the description about it, so somebody you don't know can use it without having to talk to you. In terms of the longevity of what, what I'm producing, that's also, that's also a problem. And so it's really important for me to have a good understanding of the, of the technology that I'm using and to make sure that I'm using really technologically simple solutions that aren't going to create an overhead that, that can't be sustained. As a scientist, when I'm collecting data, I have funny nomenclature that I call my files and they're very long. And so sorting it out and getting it 
processed and easily accessible to other people did take a long time to kind of sort through. But I think at the end it was worth it because now it's out there and other people can use. And I've, you know, been honored really that other people are, are actually accessing my work and it's reaching more people through that. So if I ask you after six months, hey, what exactly did you do there six months ago? Very few of us can actually still remember. So it's important that at the point in time when you still know all the details, you take the time and the effort to write it up nicely in a way you can give other people, but you also remember for yourself. If you'd asked me to share my data as a PhD student, I would have been a little bit terrified, actually. Not because I thought I was doing anything wrong, but just because it was so badly organized. Whereas I think now my practice is so much better. Like if you ask me for some data, first of all, I don't have to drive into my office and find a hard drive, which may have failed. Um, it's all on Open Neuro, the Open Science Framework, so I can just be, tell, give people a link. Usually there's code kind of documenting how I got to those numbers. So it's actually really easy to point people to bits of code. Um, and, and that kind of practice, I hope, will just get better as, as I get more senior. Where I see this going in the future, I think it will just be easier and easier to share data. Um, there's more different types of data which need to be shared. So one of the easy changes we need to see is that commitment to open science and the track record in data sharing and code sharing must be something that gets selected for in hiring decisions. Funders are definitely signing up to this. So I have a grant from the Academy of Medical Sciences and I was really pleased to see that on, on that kind of form, the application form, they're specifically asking like, you know, how have you contributed to open science? Can you give us examples of data sets you've shared? And so it's very much putting the onus on like, you should have already done this. The problem within fields like history or, or English is that there simply in the past some, haven't been many very good open data sets for people to work with. And so there haven't really been many motivations for people to learn how to work with them. As we start to make our research data more widely available, that's going to create a virtuous cycle that people will actually learn how to do even more exciting things with these data sets. It's not just research that matters, the research publication that matters, it's all of the components around research that also are seen to matter. So we go from a a publish or perish world to a share or perish world. It really increases your reach. I feel that papers that have accompanying the raw data, their raw code, get cited more often. You develop more collaborations. It's a great way to get exposure, especially as an early career researcher. And I would, yeah, definitely encourage other people to do it.